have to have done anything wrong. You simply have to eventually fall under suspicion from somebody, even by a wrong call, and then they can use the system to go back in time and scrutinize every decision you've ever made. In that stunning interview, the world met Edward Snowden, heard his explosive claims, and launched a ferocious debate. Whistleblower or traitor? One thing's for sure, it began with Snowden on camera, spilling secrets to the woman behind it. Laura Poitras, journalist, documentary filmmaker, and this Sunday, possible Oscar winner. She agreed to let us turn the camera around so Amanda Lang could ask what it's been like being Snowden's first contact. Laura, at this stage, I can offer nothing more than my word. I am a senior government employee in the intelligence community. I hope you understand that contacting you is extremely high risk. For the now, voice of filmmaker Laura Poitras, dry, no drama, and yet compelling, as she reads the first email from Ed Snowden. Keep, site you visit and the subject line you type. Is News of Snowden and leaked NSA documents is still so stunning and historic, it's easy to forget. It all began with Poitras. Immediately implicated. I ask only that you ensure this information makes it home to the American public. Thank you, and be careful. Citizen Four. Um, I work for... Uh, sorry, I don't know who you mean. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I, uh, my name is Edward Snowden. Uh, I go by Ed. She was the first person Snowden made contact with, telling Poitras he had a wealth of material proving the U.S. government was spying on its citizens. We all know what followed. Snowden in exile in Russia. The American intelligence community reeling from his disclosures. But in those early days, it was a secret shared by only Laura Poitras and an unknown source. I saw it uh, somewhere that you said you were um, psychologically and emotionally pulled in by this exchange with this unknown person. C can you describe that? What was that about? Well, I mean, you see, I mean, people talk about the film sometimes and they describe it as sort of a bit of a mystery. And that's what it felt like. I mean, I started receiving e anonymous emails from a mysterious person who I didn't know who he was and I didn't know where he worked and who was making claims that were um, quite um, shocking. And so, yeah, I mean, I was pulled into that. And then I also had a strong sense that if he turned out to be a legitimate source, that he was taking enormous personal risk. Were you suspicious of the sender of the emails in the beginning? No, I mean, I, I thought if, at first I knew that if it was legitimate, that it would be, that it was going to be dangerous for the source, um, and that I had to be really careful. And you literally said, are you trying to trick me? Yeah, I said, um, how do I know this is an entrapment? How do I know you're for real? How do I know you're not crazy? And why are you contacting me? Questions. Snowden tells Poitras, along with the leaked documents, he plans to go public. It's a decision intriguing to Poitras. What would drive someone to risk everything? Poitras, the filmmaker, asks to meet him and film him. She takes on a collaborator, colleague Glenn Greenwald, and they quickly decide to fly to Hong Kong and meet the source. When you did finally meet him, what was your impression of him? You know, Glenn and I both talked about this. We, we were both taken aback that we met somebody so young. We'd, exp we'd kind of created a, um, you know, an image of who we thought we were going to meet. And we thought we were going to meet somebody who was higher up in the government. Um, and so that was, a, that was a surprise. And then in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense, you know, um, given the fact that he's sort of of the generation sort of on the cusp of, you know, of seeing like the, uh, like growing up with the internet and then seeing it being becoming more commercialized, more militarized, more surveilled, and remembering a time when that was not the case. When you got there, how soon were you able to, to say, this is how we're going to do this? In other words, did you set ground rules? Did you have a conversation about what the shooting would look like? I mean, I started filming, you know, really quickly, you know, set up my camera, and partly because I knew, I know Glenn well enough to know that he's not going to waste any time to start working. Um, and I wanted to film that first encounter. I mean, it was my instincts as a filmmaker. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. So I know, you know, the feeling of being in the editing room. I said, oh, I wish I was rolling then. And so I wasn't going to make that mistake. Were you struck by his demeanor? 
in that in the, it, from the very beginning he comes across as uh, as very calm and very articulate um, yeah I mean he's incredibly articulate I mean it's not just that we've edited the film to pick the, to pick those moments where he's you know speaks very eloquently he does that all the time you know in retrospect I mean I think he you know he'd thought about this decision for a long time you know and w and and whether or not it's worth taking the risk that he was taking. So um, I think that it was, you know, his thinking kind of came through. This is not a question of somebody skulking around in the shadows. Yeah. These are public issues. These are not my issues, you know. These are everybody's issues. The true drama of Citizen Four is captured in Stoughton's small hotel room in Hong Kong. For Poitras, there's growing fear authorities are listening in and will find and detain them. For Snowden, the drama is personal and real. While at first serene about his decision, the NSA and people Snowden cares about back home learn what he's done. The tension builds for Snowden, and Poitras documents his growing anxiety with moments that are human. One thing that uh, definitely comes across is a level of uh, bordering on paranoia, a sense of the security risks that are all around. You know, there's the unplugging of the telephone, saying I should have done this two days ago. The one that really jumps out, of course, is the putting the blanket over the head so that he can put his encrypted, encrypted password in. It, as a viewer, completely uninformed, you kind of think, wow, well, that seems extreme. Did that, when you're in the room with that, did that frighten you? I mean, did you suddenly think, what's going on? What world are we living in that that's necessary? Yeah, I mean, some people use the word paranoia to describe some of these things, but actually in this context, I mean, he was, you know, he had a lot of knowledge he was working on. Given the fact that we were, you know, journalists meeting a source talking about these kinds of secret programs, I mean, if you even think about it, like, he, you know, Glenn, me, and him all getting on airplanes to go to the same city. I mean, you know, I think there's a good chance that we could have figured out that the government pro maybe knew that something was happening, you know, before we released the first story. Maybe not. They might not have had a clue. I stopped using a cell phone after, after being in Hong Kong because of that reason, because we know from, you know, documents disclosed by, by Snowden and reported on that our phones can be switched into microphones. Like it happens, uh, and I'm a journalist, and you know, I'd, I'd be a person who they'd be interested in knowing who I meet. He must have known uh, one way or another his life would never be the same. Did he, in the hotel room, was there a growing awareness on his part of how it would never be the same, that he was exiled, that he would never see some people again, that? I think he understood that there was no turning back, obviously. Um, but there's a, very, there's a difference between making, you know, understanding that in an abstract way and actually experiencing it. And I think what you see in the film is sort of the moment when he's, when his, his partner, Lindsay Mills, is visited by the NSA, then you realize that he's not just, it's not just a, oh, I'm taking a risk, but, but the people that he cares about, there's going to be consequences for them. But what I remember is the scene uh, when he's getting ready to leave the hotel. And he clearly doesn't know what's going to happen or where he's going. And he's got all his possessions in two shopping bags. He looks incredibly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how I remember him, mm -hmm. as somebody who's suffering. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a really um, you know, difficult, intense moment where he, he realized that he needed to go underground. And, and, and didn't know what was going to happen, you know, no matter how much you, you plan for something. I mean, the reality is different. While Citizen Four offers a portrait of the immense stress for Snowden, many consider disclosing that degree of top secret information as reckless, particularly those who inhabit the intelligence world. They see betrayal in what Snowden did. During his time at CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, Ray Boisvert was Assistant Director Intelligence. He joined us for a screening of Citizen Four. People will go see this film um, and come away with an impression. What do you think uh, the impression they should come away with? The world's a complicated place and it's a fast-moving threat environment. Uh, we've uh, done a lot to securitize and to secure our, our societies. Have we gone too far? That's perhaps the debate that's going to now roll out of all this. I think if people walk out and say, well, everything government does is bad and the security establishment is just evil and they're just out to sort of 
collect as much intelligence information and surveil everybody they possibly can. Uh, I think that's, that's an erroneous conclusion, and I think it's, uh, it's wrong-minded. It's not very productive. I think um, the bond of trust between citizens and the state, I hate to see it eroded because of information that's, in some ways, the way it's positioned, it'll lead people to the wrong conclusion. In the wake of Snowden, a debate has been sparked about government surveillance and how far it should go to protect our safety and could it affect our freedom and right to privacy. It's a subject Poitras is close to. For years, her name sat on a U.S. watch list and she was repeatedly detained at American airports. The experience shaped her thinking. So while she considers herself a journalist, she's not politically neutral. It's a film that touches on some really personal issues. Was there a danger for you of getting, of being too close to it, of feeling too much of an affinity for the messaging? You know, I think in, in the post 9-11 era, you know, there has been, I think, a moral vacuum. I mean, there have been things that have happened that I think are, you know, fundamentally violations of our principles. And so I'm not, I think that those are, that's like as a, as a citizen, as an artist, as a filmmaker, um, I do want to express those things. You know, I think it's, I think it's important. Like, if you see something that, that is a violation, I think you should say that. I don't think it's, you know, our, our role not to have opinions or, or, or make judgments on things. I'm going to imagine that you're glad on some level that Edward Snowden did what he did, that you think it was the right thing for him to do. I think it is. I mean, I, I really think that, you know, we live in a democracy and that, you know, this is, it's not like something that these kinds of decisions shouldn't happen in secret and that, you know, our, our elected officials should be accountable to citizens and we should know what our government is doing. So, so I do think that, um, that he did something that was a public service and I think history will reflect that. It's hard to say, but what do you think will happen to Edward Snowden? I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if another country came forward and offered asylum at some point. Um, um, I mean, I'm not on his legal team, so I'm not in those conversations. Um, and, um, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, in history, he'll, people will look back and say that he gave us, that, that we're at a crossroads, that technology is outpacing what we're able to do in terms of democratic oversight. We don't, we don't understand how these technological shifts are going to impact people going forward. And he's given us a moment to sort of reflect and make decisions. And, and I think historically that, that that will, you know, be recognized as being a very valuable thing. Amanda Lang, CBC News, New York.